Thank you so much for being here. We have been looking forward to today for a number of weeks. It has been on our calendars since uh, the beginning of January. We're glad that you're joining us. Of course, this is the beginning of a special series of lessons entitled Jesus is Coming Soon. And we have Devin Rausch with us, Lord willing, this morning throughout the Wednesday evening. Devin will be new to some of you, but to most of us. Of course, we have known the Rauches for a number of years. Devin and Charnay lived in this area for many, many years. We're members here at Laurel Canyon for a number of years. Devin served briefly as a deacon before eventually moving over to Moundsville, West Virginia. And it's hard to believe that he has been there now for about two years. And uh, we are, are very, very thankful to have him and his family back with us. We're going to give him the maximum amount of time that we can, and so we'll turn our time over to him in just a moment, but we will begin with a word of prayer. If you will bow with me, please. Our great Father who is in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to address you this morning. Thank you for the promise that you always hear us, that you are faithful, and we anchor ourselves to those great truths this morning. We ask your blessing to be on all of us as we open up your word this morning. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you that the Roush family had a safe trip here. And we thank you for the blessing that the next few days will be, if you will, to all of us. We pray that you would be with Devin and be with his family, be with us as hearers. Be with all who are studying and teaching throughout this building this morning. May the coming of your Son be one of the greatest hopes of our lives. And it is in his name that we pray this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It's certainly good to be with you. And I'm um, definitely looking forward to at least the first half of this week being with you. And um, we'll have some more to say to that effect uh, as the morning goes on here. But we have a lot of material that I'd like us to try and get through in our time um, as we begin today. And as you can see on your handouts there, there's a lot of information. And we're certainly not going to be able to cover all of that in the time that we have this morning, but we are going to try and get through a good, a good part of it, because I think it's very important for us to look at some of these things, starting a series of lessons as we are. The theme of this week is Jesus is coming soon. We're going to be spending some time here in a little while talking about the details of that second coming of Jesus Christ. But in our hour this morning, or half hour, whatever it is, we're going to ask the question, why believe? We go about this world and we're preaching the gospel. We're trying to warn people concerning the fact that the end is coming, that we will have to give an account for our actions. Jesus is coming soon. But why should anybody believe that? And when we ask that question, really what we're getting to is why should we listen to anything that the Bible has to say? Why should we put any stock in this book and live our life according to its instruction? I'm sure that as you have gone through your life, there has been at least one occasion where somebody has asked you, well, why do you believe what you believe? Why do you believe in the Bible? Why do you believe in Jesus Christ? And it's important that we have an answer in those types of situations. You think about there in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15, where we're told to be ready always to give that defense, to give a reason for the hope that is in us. And the amazing thing about it is that God has not left us without plain and substantial evidence to support and give us confidence in the fact that this is the Word of God. We don't have to wonder about it. We don't have to hope that it is the Word of God. We can know that it is. And of course, even with all this information that we're not going to be able to cover uh, in its entirety this morning, there's even more that you could find and investigate. And I encourage you 
to be uh, of that mindset, to always be looking for more evidence and more support so that you can give a more clear defense of your faith to those in the world. We're going to begin looking at just the internal evidence that exists for the Bible itself, what it has to say about itself and its characteristics. We know there are plenty of places in the Bible where it claims to be the Word of God. It claims to be inspired of God. You think about there in 2 Timothy chapter 3, a popular passage, verses 16 and 17. It tells us that all Scripture is inspired of God or breathed out by God. And as such, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, for correction. That the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. You come over to 2 Peter chapter 1. And at the end of this chapter here, specifically mentioning the prophecies of the Old Testament. We see there in verse 20, it says, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, notice, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so the Bible itself claims to be from a higher source. Not just the wisdom of men or the ideas of men. As you think about the Bible itself, we understand that it's not just one book, really. It's a combination of 66 books. 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. And all those fit together and work together to make one complete picture for us. It was written by over 40 different authors over the course of some 1,500 years. You try and imagine what would happen if we took that many people and took them from different parts of the world, people from different backgrounds culturally, different educations, and we said, okay, each of you are going to write what you think God's will is, or a piece of it. And you write that in your own book, and then at the end of so long, we're going to put all that together, and we're going to have one complete picture. How do you think that would turn out? It'd be... A disaster, wouldn't it? We'd have all kinds of conflicts, all kinds of uh, things that didn't line up and match up. But with the Bible, we see that it does match up. Written in three different languages. The Old Testament, Hebrew and Aramaic, and the New Testament in Greek. But as we said, we have no contradictions. We have no historical or scientific mistakes. We're going to talk about scientific evidences that we see in the Bible here in just a moment. One unified message, one complete picture. And so it's quite compelling just as we examine the characteristics of this combination of books. As we think about the manuscript evidence, that's one thing that people sometimes will come at us with. They'll say, well, how do you know that what you have today is what was originally written? How do you know it hasn't been altered or changed over the course of so many years? Well, as we consider just the manuscript evidence of the New Testament alone, some pretty compelling things for us to consider here. There's at least 24,000 extant, which just simply means still existing manuscripts of the New Testament. Now, you compare that with the next best documented ancient writing. Well, what is that? Well, that would be the Iliad. And many of us probably read that in high school. But notice there's only 643 existing copies of that particular work. That's quite a contrast, isn't it? Now, as we look at some of the lines or things within those writings that are disputed, we find that only 40 of the 20,000-some lines of New Testament text are in question today. In other words, between the different manuscripts, there's some variation. Well, what do those variations pertain to? We find that it pertains to punctuation and spelling. So nothing with the actual message, nothing with the words that are being used, the ideas that are being conveyed. Now again, we compare that to the Iliad, and we find some 764 of the 15,600 lines of its text are in dispute. So again, we see a sharp contrast. I'd like us to consider the fact that science confirms the Bible. And notice that's worded that way for a reason. It's not that the Bible confirms science. It's that science confirms the Bible. Now, the Bible is not a scientific book. In other words, it's not a science textbook, but it contains scientific truths, which 
makes sense if it's from God who created all things and set all the laws of science in motion to begin with. And so we're going to look at some examples of this, some examples of things that the Bible talks about and confirms and establishes, in some cases hundreds of years before scientists discovered these things. First of all, we could consider the Earth's suspension in space. You go back into not so recent history, really, and you find that there were certain cultures that thought that the earth was sitting on the back of a giant turtle or being held up by some giant man or something of this nature. But the Bible clearly establishes that the earth hangs upon nothing there in Job 26 and verse 7. We find that the ideal dimensions for ships are recorded in the Bible, believe it or not. And you have the ratio there. And you go back to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 15, we find this ratio is what corresponds with the measurements given for the ark that Noah built. And you research shipbuilding, and even today, this is the ratio that is followed to make a vessel that is uh, the least likely to capsize or have some kind of problem as it sails on the seas. Life is in the blood. How long did it take men to discover that life is in the blood? You think about medical history... And there was a time when if somebody had a disease, had some kind of a sickness, what would the doctors do? You heard of leeching before? Well, they would take leeches and their theory, their idea was, well, this person's got some bad blood. And so we'll put these leeches on them and that'll suck out the bad blood and then thus remove the disease or the affliction that they're suffering from. Well, what would happen? Well, that leeches would suck the blood out and then the person would die. And they'd say, well, that, you know. What sense does that make? Why isn't this working? You go back there to Leviticus chapter 17, and there it's being explained to the children of Israel uh, the purpose of them offering sacrifices, and God plainly states that the life of a creature is in its blood. You take the blood out, and you take the life out. You kill the creature. We see that kinds of animals are defined and established back in the book of Genesis chapter 1. A lot of the scientific truths that we observe even today are established in Genesis chapter 1. But you ever wonder why you can't take a dog and a cat and get them together and produce some kind of cat dog? I think there was a cartoon to that effect at one point. But you can't do that in real life, can you? You can't take a horse and a fish and make some kind of hybrid creature. It doesn't work that way. Well, why is that? Well, because God made it that way. God established that there are kinds of animals. There's the dog kind, there's the cat kind, and so on and so forth. The fact that the earth is round. The prophet Isaiah wrote concerning that there in chapter 40, verse 22, talking about how God sits above the circle of the earth. There was a point in time, and again, not too long ago, where people would think that if you would sail so far out into the ocean that you were going to go off the edge because the earth is flat, right? Ocean currents are established in the Bible. And it's actually an interesting story to look into and study. A man by the name of Matthew Maury lived in the 19th century. And what prompted him to go and discover ocean currents was actually a passage in the Bible. There in Psalm 8 and verse 8, talks about the paths of the seas. And he was reading that one day and he said, I wonder what that's talking about. I wonder what these paths of the seas are. And so he went out and he did some research and came to determine that there's currents in the ocean and established that principle, that scientific fact. All mankind is of one blood. It has been established by science that we all come from a common ancestor. Now, of course, the bulk of scientists today will tell you that that was some ape man or some, you know, uh, evolutionary creature that slowly evolved from a single-celled organism or what have you. But of course we know, again, going to Genesis chapter 1, that it was from one man and one woman that God created in the very beginning. The first law of thermodynamics is established in the scriptures, actually in Genesis chapter 2. That law states that there is a finite amount of matter in the universe. And it can change forms from, for example, a liquid to a gas to a solid, etc. But there's always going to be the same amount of matter in the universe. And we find that once God had finished all of his creation there in Genesis chapter 2, 
that he rested, that he completed his work. He was done. There was not going to be anything else created. And so we see that principle established. The second law of thermodynamics also is talked about. Come with me back here to the book of Psalms just quickly here. Psalm 102. Really just want to notice one particular verse. Notice there verse 26. Now he's speaking concerning the earth and the heavens and all the things that God made. He says there, they will perish, but you will endure. Notice, they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will change them and they will be changed. Now the second law of thermodynamics states that all things are slowly wearing down, running down. And we see that that is talked about here, that these things that God created, they're slowly growing old. They're wearing out. And of course, as we're going to be considering this week, there's going to come a time when all these things are dissolved and put to an end. The water cycle is talked about in the Bible in a couple different places. You go there to Job chapter 36, Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Both of those places clearly establish what scientists have confirmed. That the water evaporates from the oceans and the rivers and so forth and it comes down as rain and that process just continues and continues. The law of biogenesis. You know, this is one that's troubling to evolutionists because how do you get life from nothing? Well, scientists can't answer that. Well, it must have just happened somehow through some bolt of lightning that came down and struck some slime or what have you. But scientists have yet to demonstrate that they can create a living organism from non-living materials. And they won't be able to produce it because you can't. Because God, again, established things in a certain way. Life begets life. We see that in Genesis chapter 1. Just as there are paths in the seas, there are paths in the skies, in the air, the jet stream. You go to Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 6 and establishes That particular principle. And of course, again, for the sake of time this morning, we're not reading each of these passages. I encourage you to do that on your own time as you study these things for yourself. Reproduction is explained. Now, how, you know, this is one thing, again, that evolutionists, how do you explain it using that theory? How did the male and the female evolve in just the right way at just the right time? And when we say, you know, it's not just the Parts of the body that come together and and create a new life, but it's all the parts of the female that support that life as it grows and matures and all that until it's born. Very complex systems, designed systems, but yet evolutionists want us to believe that it all just happened again at the right time and the right way, and it was just a lucky, lucky shot. But we find that Jesus, again, going back to the beginning there in Mark chapter 10 and verse 6, establishes that in the beginning... God created them, male and female. And that's how reproduction is explained. Purification via running water. And some of these things, maybe you, you looked at it and say, I didn't know that was in the Bible. I didn't know the Bible even talked about that. But the fact that if you want to be pure or clean, you've got to use running water. It's a principle established clear back in the law of Moses. Leviticus chapter 15 and verse 13. There is talking about those that were unclean and the process that they would have to undergo to be clean. And it very specifically mentions the fact that they were to wash under running water. You know, again, as we go to medical history and you think about the practices of some doctors and not uh, times not too far gone. Doctors would have a whole row of patients and they would have a bowl of water sitting over here. And they'd go over here and they'd do some work on this guy here. And then they'd come over here and they'd wash their hands in this bowl of water. Then they'd go over to the next person and they'd start doing something on him. Then they'd come back to the same bowl of water. And they would just repeat that over and over again. And they were finding our patients are dying. All this disease is being spread. All this bacteria is being spread. And they couldn't figure it out. Finally, it was discovered, hey, we have this contaminated bowl of water with all these different germs And it's just sitting there, stagnating and pooling. And they said, maybe if we use running water, hey, maybe if you would have read the Bible, (laughs) you would have saved some lives. Sanitation is talked about in the Bible 
Back in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 12 and 13, the Israelites were given plain instructions about what they were to do when they had to use the facilities, to put it nicely. They were to go outside the camp, first of all. They were to dig a hole. They were to cover it up when they were done. Why? So that they could be clean. So that they wouldn't spread germs. You think about some of the world wars that were waged and how many soldiers died because these principles weren't followed. They weren't going outside the camp. They were going inside the camp. And they were sharing in common places and spreading those bacteria. And people were dying not because they were getting shot at by the enemy, but because they were getting sick from disease. One final thing on this point. The fact that our bodies are made of dust. Of course, we know in Genesis chapter 1 that we're told that from the dust of the ground, God formed man. But science has confirmed that our bodies are made up of 28 basic elements that exist. And is it any wonder as we see an animal that gets hit on the side of the road and maybe it's a route that we travel frequently to work or what have you and we drive by so long and before you know it, the animal is not there anymore. Well, why is that? Well, because it broke down. It returned to the dust. And the same thing happens with our human bodies. So isn't it amazing? Isn't it compelling that the Bible, again, not being a science book, nevertheless establishes scientific truths. And in some cases, these things were established hundreds of years before the scientists of men figured them out. And what are some other places we could go to consider why we should believe, why we should trust the fact that this is the Word of God. Well, we could look at fulfilled prophecy. You have a couple examples there, again, on your handouts that we're not going to take the time to notice this morning. Uh, some prophecies in the Old Testament. What we do want to focus on specifically here with our time is some of the Messianic prophecies. Now, there are over 300 of them. And again, we don't have time to look at all those, but we are going to focus on eight of them. And we'll see the significance of that here in just a few moments. But we see the fact that Christ was to be born in Bethlehem. It was plainly stated by the prophet Micah. There in chapter 5 and verse 2, we see the fulfillment in Luke chapter 2. The fact that there was going to be a forerunner to Christ, John the Baptist. That is also talked about in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1. And we see the fulfillment in Mark chapter 1. The fact that Christ was to enter Jerusalem on a donkey. And actually, as you look at the prophecy there, you find that it specifically mentions that it was the colt of the donkey that he was to ride on. And what happened there in Matthew chapter 21? Well, just what the prophet had written was fulfilled. The fact that Christ was, be, was to be betrayed by a friend. Psalm 41 and verse 9. And of course, we know that Judas Iscariot was the one, one of his own disciples who carried out that betrayal. The price of betrayal was prophesied specifically. There in Zechariah 11 and verse 12, mentions the fact that it was to be 30 pieces of silver. And that's just what happened. We go to Matthew 26, verse 15. It's also talked about what would become of that money. You recall that as you read the account there in Matthew, that after Judas had betrayed Christ, that he was remorseful. And he went back to the priest, you recall, and he threw the money at their feet and he said, you know, I've done a terrible thing. Well, they, reasoning with themselves, said, well, we can't just put this back in the treasury. It's blood money. And so what did they do with it? They went and they bought, you recall, the potter's field. And as you go back to the prophecy there in Zechariah, we find that that is what is established. The fact that Jesus would keep silent when on trial, it's mentioned there in Isaiah chapter 53, one of the more popular passages that we would go to in thinking about prophecies concerning the Messiah. But we see that that was the case there in Mark chapter 14 as he stood trial. And finally, the fact that Christ was to be crucified. In Psalm 22 there, verse 16, you recall that it is mentioned the fact that they, are, they have pierced my hands and my feet. And the interesting thing about that was at the time that was being written, crucifixion was not a known method of execution. It didn't come along till years later. Of course, it was perfected by the Romans. But yet, we find it fulfilled. That Jesus died on a cross in just the way that it was described. 
Now, why these eight? Why focus on these eight? Well, there's a man by the name of Dr. Peter Stoner. And he wrote this book called Science Speaks. He used the laws of probability. He was a mathematician. He determined that the likelihood of one man fulfilling all eight of those prophecies that we just noted together. Again, there's over 300 in total. But the likelihood of just those eight being fulfilled in one man. One in 10 to the 17th power, which is a 10 followed by 17 zeros. Now, of course, that's a number that we all use every day, right? Well, that number is 100 quadrillion. Now, it would be very difficult to put that in perspective for us, but I've got a couple things here. First of all, as we consider the likelihood of being struck by lightning in a year's time, something we all consider pretty unlikely, right? But the odds of that are one in only 700,000. You see the comparison, the contrast? Now, this Peter Stoner put it this way. He said, if you had 100 quadrillion silver dollars, you'd have enough silver dollars to cover the entire state of Texas two feet deep. Now, try and fathom that. There's a lot of coins here. Imagine you take one of those coins and you mark it, and then you cast that out into that giant ocean of coins. And you take a person and you blindfold him and you spin him around and you send him off. You say you can go as far as you want. You stay within the borders of the state, but you can go anywhere you want. You pick up one coin. The likelihood of him picking that coin that you marked is the likelihood that one man would specifically fulfill just those eight prophecies concerning the Messiah. But yet they were fulfilled. Now, that should get our attention. Why believe? Well, we've got some pretty compelling evidence before us here as to why we should believe. One final thing, and I'm quickly running out of time, so we'll try and get through these quickly here together. But as we consider the miracles that were performed, and again, this is a, a topic that really we could span a number of lessons on, as it was not just Jesus that performed miracles, but nonetheless, we want to focus on just his for the sake of time. But you come here to John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, and we, we find the reason for which Jesus performed these different miracles. It says, truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, not written in the gospel of John. But these are written, notice, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Again, we don't have time to read all these passages, but we see that Christ demonstrated power over nature there in Matthew chapter 8, where he told the winds and the waves to cease. Peace be still, and they obeyed, and they marveled on that occasion. As you recall, they worshipped him and recognized that he was indeed the Son of God. In Matthew chapter 9, we find one instance where Jesus demonstrated power over physical ailments. The woman with the issue of blood that had been suffering for some 12 years, we're told. She touched the hem of his garment and was healed instantly. Power over natural laws. There in Matthew chapter 14, can any of you walk on the water? We understand if you try and do that, you're going to sink pretty quick, right? But Jesus, the Son of God, He who established and created the laws of the universe... He walked on the water in Matthew chapter 14 and actually enabled one of his disciples to come out and walk on the water with him. He rose a good friend of his, Lazarus, from the dead, demonstrating power over death in John chapter 11. Demonstrated power over physical items with the five loaves and two fishes that he used to feed the whole multitude of people. Some 5,000 men alone, not even counting the women and children. There again in Matthew 14. Power over Satan and demons in Matt, or Mark chapter 5. The first 20 verses there, we have the episode where Christ encountered the man who was demon-possessed. He was so fierce that no one could tame him or bind him. But yet Jesus told those demons to come out. And they departed from the man and went into the herd of swine. And the swine ran over the cliff. Perhaps the most compelling piece of evidence that we might consider is the resurrection. 
Again, I don't know about you, but I've never heard of a human being who has died and then a few days later just came back to life. But yet we have, and it's, it's one of the best documented historical events that you can read about. The fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Now that tells me that maybe I should pay some attention to this man. Maybe there's more to him than just flesh and bone. Maybe I should take heed to the message that he is coming soon. Just quickly here, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's start here in verse 12. It says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how does some among you say there is no resurrection? If there's no resurrection, then Christ is not risen. If Christ is not risen, notice the result. If Christ didn't rise from the dead, what does that mean for us today who are following his words? Verse 14, if Christ is not risen, our preaching is empty and your faith is empty. We might as well go home if Christ did not rise from the dead. In other words, he goes on there in verse 15. Yes, we're found false witnesses of God because we've testified that he raised up the Christ whom he did not raise up. If, in fact, the dead do not rise. He repeats the, the thought there in verse 16, verse 17. If Christ is not risen again, notice your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, and also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. But verse 20, now he affirms the truth. Now Christ is risen from the dead. He's become the first fruits of those who've fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man, capital M, that is Christ, also came the resurrection of the dead. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. Now, there are different theories of men. We'll go through these just ever so quickly here. Different theories that men have developed to explain away the empty tomb. I want us to think about this logically. If the apostles were lying about the fact that Christ rose from the dead, why be subjected to the persecution that they faced and the untimely death that they experienced for something that wasn't even true? People don't give their lives for something they know to be a lie. And also, why would they willingly sentence themselves if they even believed in God at all? Why would they willingly submit themselves to hell fire because we're told that those that lie, all liars will find their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. There in Revelation 21 and verse 8. So there's nothing in it for them to make this up. The tomb was guarded. Matthew 27, verse 65. You recall how the Jews, remembering the words of Christ, remembering that He said, after the three days I'm going to rise again, they came to Pilate they said, look, so that they don't pull a fast one on us and go in and steal the body or try and say that His words indeed came to pass, make the tomb as secure as you know how. And that was done. And those Roman soldiers didn't mess around. You recall the jailer there in Acts chapter 16 when he thought the prisoners had fled? What was he about to do? He was about to kill himself. Because he knew that if on his watch the prisoners got away, it was his head. These weren't men who were sleeping on the job or distracted by butterflies flying around or what have you while the disciples came in and stole the body. The tomb was guarded. The disciples were defeated. They were in no place to even pull off something like this. There in John chapter 20 and verse 19, you recall it tells us that the disciples were gathered together in one place and the doors, the windows were shut. Why? For fear of the Jews. They said, well, if they discover where we are, they're going to put us to death too. Acts chapter 1 and verse 6, even just before Jesus ascended back into heaven, there were some who said, Lord, are you going to now give the kingdom back to Israel? They still thought it was all earthly. It was all physical. They didn't even fully comprehend it all yet. Finally, Christ was confirmed dead. You go to Mark chapter 15 where uh, Joseph of Arimathea came to request the body and Pilate, you recall, was amazed that he was dead already. 
And you recall that he had the centurion go and confirm the fact that Jesus was indeed dead. You know, the theory goes that, well, Jesus didn't really die. And then when he was in the tomb there, he kind of came to, and despite the fact that he had been flogged and that he had had his hands and feet pierced and his side pierced with the sword and all these different things, that he had the strength somehow to get up and to roll that massive stone out of the way and sneak out of there without anybody seeing him. That's logical, right? There is no logical way, in spite of the evidence, to explain away the empty tomb. And as such, it is perhaps the most compelling evidence that we could consider as to why we believe and why we carry on the tradition established by Christ to observe the bread and the fruit of the vine on the first day of the week to remember the Lord's death and proclaim it until he comes again. We believe these things because we have evidence to support them. And so I pray that going through these things this morning, our time is up. I pray that this has been beneficial. I pray that you will take these handouts and study them, memorize them, use them, do further research on your own so that we can be ready to give that defense and have a reason behind us in our faith. Thank you for your attention this morning.